Uh, thank you for everybody for attending. Uh, this is a session uh, among in part of this seminar series that's been going on, and this particular one is on IP protection. Uh, I'm Bruce Tedeschi. I'm the Director of Intellectual Property here at Innovation, and um, really pleased to present um, uh, a special, special guest keynote speaker today uh, to fit in with what we're going to try to do. Um, I hope you get a sense from this presentation of the kind of dynamic forces and these dynamic events that are occurring uh, globally at the US Patent Office, et cetera, that's going on. It impacts a great deal of what we do in our office of innovation. It impacts our inventors out there and the kinds of um, great inventions that they present to us daily. And uh, hopefully um, this little seminar will give you a feel for the kinds of questions and issues that are that we're constantly grappling with every day, and um, so I think there's three parts. We have three parts to the session. One is um, our guest speakers going to be delivering a keynote address. Then our guest speaker and myself will sit on this chair. There won't be any logs or anything, but we'll have a bit of a fireside chat, and uh, I will ask him some of the try to get into some of the issues, maybe a little bit more deep deeper to see his comments on it. And at that point, I really would appreciate, we really appreciate any questions that we might have from the audience. Um, and then finally, uh, one of my colleagues in the Office of Innovation, a patent attorney, Sharon Walker, uh, has three uh, distinguished uh, principal investigators that we have from our office who will discuss their experiences that they've had in the office and with the patenting process and the commercialization process. Um, if I had to show the credentials of my guest speaker, David Kapos, it would be uh, it would be a papyrus. It would be a long list, a lot longer than I have on this paper. Uh, just very, very briefly, some of the highlights. Uh, he's an elect electrical engineer by training. Um, during the Obama administration, he was actually the head of the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, he then, I think preceding that, was the chief patent attorney at IBM, and uh, he's currently a partner in a really great firm in New York City, uh, Kravit. Um, he's an expert on the global issues and all issues related to the kinds of problems that we're finding ourselves, so we're very honored to be able to, uh, to, to hear him and some of the comments he has to take and what his take is on the current situation. It's a very plastic situation that we're having in the Patent Office. David Kapos. Okay, well, good evening, and thank you, Bruce, for that introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be able to spend some time talking about something that I certainly feel strongly about, the U.S. and global IP system, particularly with respect to the life sciences industry. So in keeping with Bruce's charge, what I'm going to do for about the next 25 minutes is to talk about, first, about some... I'll call it meta-trends um, in the U.S. and global IP system that, uh, that, that uh, piece together this era of uncertainty that you see there. And then in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to start focusing in on some topics that will probably be near and dear to PIs in this room. What's going on with Section 101 under our patent law? What's going on with Section 102 under our patent law? What's going on um, with Sections 103 and 112? And what I mean by that is basically what can be patented in the U.S. That's changed a lot. What does it mean for an invention to be uh, clever enough, right, to be enough of an invention to get patent protection? That's changed a lot. What do you have to disclose in a patent application in order to get patent protection. That's changed a lot also. So, okay, this is gonna be a whirlwind uh, because there's lots and lots of material, but we can take anything up that you like during the fireside chat uh, discussion afterwards. Well, uh, the state of the US patent system. 10 years ago, I would have been telling you the state of the US patent system is, things are perceived to be a little out of control with too much abuse of the system. Now it is the opposite. We are beginning to see headline news stories. There was another one literally this morning in the Financial Times declaring 
that there's something else wrong with the U.S. patent system. It's become too weak. We are discriminating against inventors in this country. And what is behind that? Well, here's what's behind it. Um, our system has statistically deteriorated. There's just no question about it. A uh, concilium in, in Israel called the Puglash Concilium measures about 50 or so objective criterion associated with patent system strength. And the reality is we're now tied with Hungary uh, for the 10th strongest patent system in the world. Every year before this year, the U.S. was number one. Every year this survey has ever been done, the U.S. was number one. We have now fallen to number 10. Clearly, there's something that's changing. So what is it that underlies that meta trend? Well, first of all, disputes are way down. Maybe that's a good thing that disputes are way down. But as we all know, in this room, disputes go down enough. That's a sign that a system is becoming irrelevant and people are looking for other ways to capture competitive advantage. One way or another, one thing that could be said for sure, disputes about patents in the U.S. are in a long-term downward trend, and they've been going down for quite a few years now. At the same time, challenges of patents in the U.S., PTO's own homegrown group called the Patent Trial and Appeal Board are running at fever pitch, and you see the numbers here. Um, if you wonder whether these are big numbers or not, about 150 to as many as 250 of these challenges a month. Um, it turns out when we implemented the America Invents Act, which was the 2011 legislation that created this system, which was passed when I was um, in the government, we estimated about one third of this many challenges. You're, the agencies are required to put these estimates together. So it is fair to say that the Patent Trial and Appeal Board has vastly overachieved. It's also fair to say that the Patent Trial and Appeal Board has proved to be somewhat detrimental to the interests of patentees. Some would say discriminatory against patentees. I certainly wouldn't go that far, but I would, um, I, I would agree with the view that it has turned out to be a little too tightly wound given what we are trying to achieve. And you can see the statistics here. Most patents that are challenged have at least one claim found invalid. Large numbers of patents have all of their claims found invalid. And at some level, it becomes a problem, including especially for industries like life sciences. Um, stacking on top of all of those issues, and, and in my view, clearly a problem, patents, particularly in the life sciences field and in the software field, which everyone in this room knows is, a, is an engine for the life sciences field, are now being found invalid as per se not involving patentable subject matter at a frightening pace. And this has come on the back of a series of very controversial Supreme Court decisions that have now gone unchecked and have sent a message to US innovators that your life sciences and software innovations are not patentable in this country. This is a real problem. I hope we'll talk about it more in the um, fireside chat session. Um, probably on the positive side, in terms of what's going on with our system, our country is now uh, requiring losers in patent infringement lawsuits to pay the bill much more of the time than was the case in the past. And that has caused patent plaintiffs and even defendants to be more circumspect about the issues they're willing to raise in litigation. And what you see here is the effects of a couple of important um, federal circuit cases that happened about three and a half years ago that have caused a whole different world in terms of when courts are willing to require losing parties to pay the bill for the winning party. And I think this is actually a good trend it definitely has caused folks to step back and think about what they're doing more. So what do we take from that sort of quick tour de force of the data? We definitely have had a major course correction. We definitely have fixed problems in the U.S. patent system that 10 years ago made it too easy to game. Now we've got a different question that we're facing. Have we done too much? So let me turn from there very briefly to touch on a, on a higher scope 
question, what's going on on a global basis, before I come down to the micro level and talk about those particular matters that you probably deal with day by day. And I'll talk about three um, sort of subtopics here. Standard essential patents, um, the extraterritorial application of antitrust laws to the intellectual property field is a very important issue, including for life sciences. And I would tell you standard essential patents are important to life sciences also. And then specifically, the tension between incentives and access to medicines, which is very central to your field. So SEPs are all about um, uh, licensing of patents that wind up in one way or another in an industry standard. The smartphone industry is the best example. We all use 4G LTE. We'll soon be using 5G. We use Wi-Fi. Those are global standards, um, and they're great. The problem is they pit the interests of patent holders whose patents become enormously important versus the interests of implementers, those companies that want to make phones but don't create the underlying innovation. And finding the right balance is extremely challenging. So courts have been wrestling with this. There are a whole set of doctrines uh, that govern this area of the law. And um, uh, just before we go on, uh, what's happened in recent years is we've had a spate of theories come out of the academy that have been picked up quickly by judges and antitrust enforcement agencies, but those theories have turned out to be inaccurate. So we've got a problem now in this area where based on ideas that seemed like they were right at the time but didn't hold up under data, we're trying to correct U.S antitrust authorities, U.S. courts, and their overseas counterparts uh, before things go any worse relative to this delicate balance. And too much emphasis is shifted toward implementers and too little towards innovators. So that's a quick tour de force of the SEP area. The reason I say this relates to life sciences is because Standard essential patents are a lot like life sciences patents in that they become required in order to practice in a field, right, in, a, in an entire broad area. And so anything that happens in the standards area winds up quickly bleeding over into life sciences. And I hear echoes from regulators and policymakers of the same arguments they use in the standards area trying to apply those arguments in the life sciences area which is why I thought this topic would be one you'd want to be generally aware of. Extraterritorial application of antitrust laws is about the following. 20 years ago, there were something like seven antitrust authorities in the world, few in the U.S., a few in Europe. That was it. Now there are at least 140 antitrust authorities all over the world, each enforcing their own vision of what helps their country succeed. And in many cases, that means advantaging local economic participants over the interests of global participants. That's not really what antitrust was made to do, and it's got a tremendous impact um, that is just now beginning to be felt. This is another area that I think is on its way to bleeding over into life sciences if we're not able to check it and start getting each country to apply antitrust in a way that's very cognizant of its limited applicability to the IP area. Uh, so I won't say any more about that. I just wanted you to kind of have a quick sense that antitrust and IP are coming into more contact on an international basis. And it is a problem when patents are, um, are rendered unenforceable by antitrust authorities on the basis of something other than consumer welfare. Um, thirdly, before we get into the micro topic, um, I really want to just talk a little bit about this meta tension. And I'll use as a kind of a way to talk about it, um, what's been going on in the, uh, uh, with the folks down in New York City, actually, where I'm now from, and um, uh, applying world health access to medicines concepts to the life sciences industry. Um, and there's a tremendous tension in that regard. The issue that's come up 
is you know the desire on the one hand to have public research be adequately funded, incentives for that kind of funding, um, national coordination, all the things that you know we want as a matter of general policy um, versus having strong incentives for innovation that we all know in this room are absolutely critical to bring capital to the innovation ecosystem. And um, so what happened was, just to go back and, and, and finish the first thought here, a UN high panel was formed in order to study this issue. And they came out with an absolutely terrible report um, that impugned the global intellectual property system and blamed access to medicines in developing countries on the intellectual property system. I mean, I think in shorthand, that's about what they came out with. Uh, a number of us were watching this, were extremely upset about it. Fortunately, uh, the U.S. government was all over it. The European Union was all over it. And they came out with too much information for you to be able to read here. Uh, but the net of it is they were strongly critical of this report, saying, look, the innovation ecosystem is the friend of healthcare advancement and access to medicines in developing countries. The reasons that developing countries don't have access to medicines are many, but they're not the intellectual property system. And there's been a lot of data brought to bear for the proposition that um, intellectual property incentives do not deprive people in developing countries of access to medicines. Many other things do. So this is a major issue, continues to play out. Um, uh, you know, I hear complaints regularly when I'm traveling overseas about the intellectual property system being thought of as an impediment to access to medicines. Um, it's something we all need to be very aware of, and uh, we need to have our policymakers in Washington, D.C. helping us with this. So I want to comment before we focus just very briefly on something you've probably read about in the newspapers recently. And this is Allergan, you know, famous and generally well-respected um, pharmaceutical company uh, selling a patent portfolio to an Indian tribe, an American Indian tribe, Native American tribe, um, in order to take advantage of sovereign immunity and to exempt the patent portfolio from challenge in the USPTO. I just wanted you to be aware of this. Um, whether this is going to be an effective strategy is very much in doubt. It's garnered widespread public condemnation. I think that's fair to say. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal ran front page articles on it. Rest assured, those media outlets don't run front page articles on life sciences patents to complement the system. Right? They run those articles for a very different reason, and that was why they ran those articles. The court hearing this case in the Eastern District of Texas just yesterday decided that the underlying patents are invalid. That's a district court decision. The court has also used the word sham transaction to describe what's going on with the Allergan assignment. So whether this will prove an effective way to shelter a patent portfolio from USPTO challenge is an open question. One thing that is not open is that it is very unpopular um, in the popular media. And I would say it doesn't really do well for the life sciences industry. And those of us, like I think probably all of us in this room who care about its success, it frankly makes the whole industry look bad. Now, lastly, um, Access to patent protection for life sciences innovation. I said we talk about um, uh, the issue of what makes an invention. That's obviousness. The issue of patentable subject matter more generally. That's, uh, you know, this issue that I mentioned before of courts in the U.S. now saying you could take your life sciences innovations elsewhere, but we won't grant patents to them in the U.S. no matter how good they are. And then very briefly, um, the doctrines that describe how much has to be said in a patent application in order to get a patent? Enablement, written description, and then I'll, uh, if I can, I'll, I'll just touch very, very briefly on TC Heartland and the venue issue. So obviousness, 
Um, I'm not going to try and go through all of this, but I will tell you, if you want any or all of these slides, um, you know, the team here is happy to provide them. And this is kind of a good overview of what's going on with these doctrines. We had a major change in the law um, in this KSR decision back in 2007. And probably many of you noticed as PIs that the Patent Office began pushing back. And I was running it from 2009 to 2013. And I was instructing examiners, apply the law, push back harder on, uh, on obviousness. There has been some retrenchment in that area with the courts pushing back on the USPTO and saying, don't be so hard on applicants um, in terms of how you apply and assert that their submissions are obvious. And you see that um, reflected in these recommendations. Um, require the examiner. We, the office is now asking examiners to explain their reasoning for obviousness rejections. Require examiners to do that. Have your attorneys push back on them. That's fair, it's appropriate, and it's now getting traction in the USPTO. Intuition, common sense aren't enough to make a rejection on this basis. Factual and technical evidence are required. So there are some things you can do relative to the enhanced scope of the obviousness doctrine. Patentable subject matter. I mentioned these, I'll say, candidly, disastrous cases where the Supreme Court took the U.S. law in a very, very problematic direction. And um, those cases include, first, uh, the, the Myriad decision back in 2013 um, uh, and the Mayo decision, so actually slightly before that. And then more recently, this Alice decision, which some people would say is a software decision, and clearly it involves a software patent on its face. But again, I feel this is also a life sciences decision because so much of life sciences innovation is implemented through software and so much of it involves software. So the, um, the Supreme Court through these cases created this new two-part two analysis, and hopefully we could talk about it with Bruce a little bit later in, in, a, in a few minutes. The net of the analysis is that it requires applicants and patent examiners to decide whether a given invention is, quote, abstract. And imagine trying to make that decision on any reasoned, objective, and repeatable basis. It's impossible. So we shouldn't be surprised that we now have the federal circuit, the district courts, the patent office, the public, and smart people like everyone in this room in total chaos. That's the effect of these decisions. So the impact, not surprisingly, huge number, 86% of, of, of cases of patents being found invalid in this field. This is disastrous, right? Um, and uh, what do you do about it? <laughs> well, we need to do something dramatic about it. And some people, including myself, have said it's time to do away with the whole doctrine because uh, it's not doing our country any good. But in the meantime, in patent prosecution, you do need to be very detailed uh, in your specifications to provide enough support to get around these kinds of rejections. You do need to draft applications um, with uh, claims that are narrower in the U.S. to avoid abstract subject matter uh, rejections, but you can still get broader claims overseas, and hopefully Bruce and I can talk about that. Um, so enablement, written description, this is how much you need to include in your specification in order to have a patentable invention. Well, again, this area has been addressed also by the Supreme Court um, and, uh, as you can see here, by the Federal Circuit in a case that I think originated here in the Boston area. And uh, the, what the courts have said is we want more disclosure. We want to know more about your invention. We want you to tell us more about how it works, um, what would be required in order to make it. And that, of course, creates a tension that we can talk about later, but all of you, I'm sure, feel it between providing enough detail in the patent application to satisfy these requirements versus your desire and or those of your clients to publish quickly because you're in an academic community. And that's a tension that we can't make it go away, but we need to manage it. So there are numerous implications here. You do have a heightened requirement. 
You do need to devote additional time to disclosure. You do need to provide detailed examples in order to deal with these requirements. And I totally get that that runs counter to the academic publication desirement, desire. So what do you do? Um, you, you, I mean, we got to adapt to the requirements as they exist. So we have to take on the world as we find it. Uh, but there are some things that can be put in patent applications. Extra disclosure of components and steps. Um, disclosure of chemical reactions. Disclosure of how intermediate components of the invention can be prepared. This is really important because this is stuff that's not really inventive, but it's the kind of the nuts and bolts that enable your invention to work. And by disclosing those kinds of things, you can go a long way toward getting over these problems. And I'll let you read the rest if you want to look at the materials. Lastly, um, and we'll, I'll keep us on time here, T.C. Heartland. So this is a recent decision out of the U.S. Supreme Court just in May that um, addressed this issue of where you can file a patent infringement lawsuit. And previously, you basically could file one anywhere in the U.S., and that caused what's called form shopping. Of course, plaintiffs file lawsuits, and for the most part, defendants generally don't file lawsuits. So plaintiffs are looking for a place, a court, a venue that's going to be the most hospitable to them. And the Eastern District of Texas stepped up years ago and said, we like patent infringement lawsuits, and they created a very hospitable environment. And so no surprise, nearly half of all patent infringement lawsuits in the U.S. were getting filed in the Eastern District of Texas. Supreme Court finally stepped in. A number of us, including myself, had worked on legislation for like 15 years to try and solve this problem, and we were unsuccessful. The Supreme Court finally stepped in and said, enough is enough. We're now going to say that you got to file patent infringement lawsuit essentially against the defendant where you find the defendant and not anywhere that the defendant is doing business. And that has caused a dramatic change. So you can see the numbers here. Pre-TC Heartland, Eastern District of Texas was by far and away the number one venue. Post-TC Heartland, the action has shifted to Delaware, California, Massachusetts, um, uh, and other districts where there's a lot of tech activity, right? And, you know, life sciences in the case of the Boston area. Probably good news here. Um, so that's it. Keep us on time. I think we can turn over now, Bruce, to our fireside chat. Is that okay? <laughs> So David and Bruce are going to do a quick fireside, and they want to engage you all. I'm Chris Coburn. If there's anyone here I don't know, I, I'm up here. Uh, I was supposed to be kicking it off, but I was trapped presenting to the hospital presidents a few minutes ago. But I just, uh, on a note of uh, uh, personal gratitude, Dave's an old friend. Uh, we worked together uh, long before he had gone into government service. And I think the thing to know, and Bruce might have stressed this, is what a change agent he was during the time he led the patent office, and he really has earned the, his status as the dean of the American intellectual property community. And our dean, Dean Tedeschi, is going to conduct this fireside. He has, uh, Bruce will have some questions, but we also want to get some from you all in the audience. And I, if Bruce didn't introduce, uh, he's an absolute stalwart uh, leading our IP group, PhD from uh, Yale in psychobiology, and his JD is from Georgetown University. So Bruce and David. Okay, so excellent talk, David. Uh, in terms of the presentation and also in terms of what we do, you uh, uh, PIs and you inventors understand that when you work with our innovation office, uh, <coughs> historically we deal with issues. And when he mentions 103, 102, 101, you know that we're dealing with sections of the patent code. Historically, which we will discuss, I'd like to ask some questions in a minute of you of, of 102 and 103. Basically, that is, is it patentable based on what's in the, in, in the prior art and uh, or would it have been obvious? So those are issues we've always dealt with historically and our PIs and our inventors know we historically deal with this. As your presentation shows and as maybe some of our inventors are feeling, feeling it a bit, uh, and we in our office certainly feel feel it quite a bit, is Section 101 issues. Is it the appropriate subject matter? Is it something that the uh, Patent Office will file on? And as David has, has expressed to you, there's been a, a retraction in, in terms of the Supreme Court interpreting how the Patent Office 
decides these issues and these questions on what is the appropriate subject matter. And one of the things that you mentioned in your talk, the first thing, was uh, particularly how the health sciences might be hit by some of these decisions that have come out in the Supreme Court in terms of 101 and what's the appropriate subject matter. Any, um, any thoughts on, uh, as to why that might be the case? Yeah, a couple of things. So, you know, if you step back and look at the policy, it's understandable. Um, you've got patient health care concerns, access to medicines. In the case of the Myriad case, right, you were talking about an important test for breast cancer that everyone in this room, you know, either has someone who's been affected by it or knows someone who or has someone in their family or knows someone who's been affected by that. And so you've got an, a very understandable access to um, a requirement for affordable access to these tests, but that gets pitted against um, the need to have the next test and to think about the disease or the ailment or the type of cancer that hasn't yet been cured and what happens if we don't have the incentives in place to address that. And the system needs to balance those two things. And what's unfortunately gone wrong is that we have, we have so uh, detracted from the patent system in this life sciences area by declaring that discoveries are no longer patentable, and that is unfortunate, but that is basically the truth, and diagnostic techniques are no longer patentable, that's really unfortunate, but that's the truth as I see it, that we are causing, a, in my estimation and observation, a flight from investment, from bringing capital resources to turning great innovation into patient outcomes in the life sciences field. Yeah, and that's something we grapple with a lot now in terms of this 101 issue where we get our patent attorneys to try to draft claims that, that can encapsulate us within a statutory patentable subject matter, hoping that those kind of claims will, you know, will, will, will survive this 101, which I want to get into now is, you had mentioned it, is this, uh, apparently the court is trying to grapple with this level of abstraction. So we have the Alice case on software, you know, we have the Prometheus case on biomarkers, et cetera. Um, where is the equilibrium, do you think that's going to, what kind of teaching or what kind of information can we get that will help our PIs, that will help our office trying to grapple with where we think the court is going, but we don't really have the kind of guidelines that are necessary to, to deal with that. Well, right. So the, the Supreme Court has, you know, quite unfortunately now washed its hands of the situation after coming out with the Alice case. It had a golden opportunity in a case called Sequinom, which is a case that involved uh, the, um, what, what, a replacement for amniocentesis, um, which... Uh, was hinged on, based on, a very interesting discovery, the discovery that the blood of a mother uh, properly processed um, contained the DNA of an unborn baby. So suddenly you replace a very invasive, somewhat risky test with a simple blood sample. It was a major discovery. It was heralded in research magazines, research um, uh, publications as a breakthrough discovery. Even the courts that found the patent invalid admitted it was a breakthrough discovery, but they were bound by the uh, case law of the Supreme Court to find that breakthrough invention unpatentable, and the Supreme Court declined to take cert on it despite that they had over 40 amicus briefs submitted, including one by Microsoft which is, of course, not a life sciences company, but felt motivated enough to weigh in and say, hey, we're not a life sciences company, but even we can see this is a real problem. Supreme Court didn't take the case. They walked away from the situation. So, Bruce, what do you do? Two things, I think, as I mentioned, one, there needs to be a groundswell from the research community saying, this is ridiculous, because there are now members of Congress who are interested in this issue Folks that I meet with regularly actually hope to be down there later this week and have some Hill calls on this very topic. They're organizing conferences. They're drafting legislation. This is now being discussed. We need to push our representatives 
in both houses of Congress to do something about this before this disaster becomes evident um, in the economy. That's one thing we do. In the shorter term, we got to cope with the situation as we find it. So Bruce, this is what my, what I tell clients, you know, day to day is you got to, first of all, you got to recognize that a pure discovery or a pure diagnostic is probably not going to be patentable. So file those claims in Europe. Sure, file them in the U.S., keep claims pending, fight, fight, fight. Don't let anything drop because we hope we change the law. But file the broader claims in Europe and China where you can get those, and I hope we can come back to that topic. And in the U.S., you've got to add something other than the discovery um, to the innovation. So this is why you've got to have more disclosure and you've got to be able to get more precise. Where, will your claims be useful once you get a valid claim through the office? That's what I don't know. And what I, what I see is claims becoming so narrow that they cover essentially a preferred embodiment, a very, very specific test that's easy to avoid. So I'm not sure I've got, I've got you a good way around this, but. Yeah, and that's the problem we always face on a commercial level is pat a lot of what's all about patents is broadness versus narrowness. How broad can we go? The broader we go, the more economically viable, but sometimes the harder it is to get and the narrower. But, but you are, you are Absolutely, I think, saying there's a big distinction between what we can now get in the United States versus what we can get outside of the United States yeah, yeah. in terms of, you know, claiming strategy and claim sets. Yeah. So a, a, a senator um, a while ago I was in visiting and, and I said, look, this situation with panel subject matter is out of hand. And he said, look, I, I got it, but I got like, you know, 99 colleagues who don't really know anything about this. What can I say to them that will cause them to get interested in this? And I said, Mr. Senator, I now believe that it's easier to get a patent on a life sciences innovation in the People's Republic of China than it is in the United States of America. And he said, if you can get data that supports that, that is very interesting. So I went out, actually had a smart associate go out and find, um, and we were easily able to find thousands of patents that had been granted in China and Europe, but denied in the US. We curated those to, to make sure that we had you know, cases that were finally abandoned in the US and not just continuations or things that you would say, that's not really a dead case. And situations where the, the rejection was on 101, we were easily able to find more than 100 examples and we stopped then. It was just like, all right, enough is enough. But it is demonstrably true and I've given this research over to folks in, you know, in Washington, D.C., it is demonstrably true that it is easier to get patent protection for life sciences innovation in China and Europe than it is in the U.S. Huh, okay. Um, in terms of that sequinome, um, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about that case or maybe associated cases. The Myriad decision was based on, you know, we invent a lot of, like, what would be considered natural products where we don't do an actual manipulation, like with an antibody, for example, you know, uh, outside of like a humanized antibody or where you alter sequences or whatever, but an antibody per se. And a lot of those kinds of discoveries are questionable, whether in fact they're patentable now in terms of subject matter being natural products. And that sequinome experiment, I'm wondering if that's starting to lead to also a prohibition in statutory subject matter on the use of natural products? Oh, I think it, it definitely is. The, the nub of the issue, you use the right word, Bruce. You know, we got to get very precise about these problems. Um, discoveries are important. And where you folks live every day is a world that is governed more and more and more by discoveries. Discoveries of correlations, discoveries of gene sequences that correlate to certain human issues, right? Life sciences or, or treatment related issues. Discoveries of, the, um, of, of the, the molecules that will act against certain human conditions. With life sciences research having progressed to where it has, where you can, we can be so precise about targeting medical treatments discovery is very much where the action is. So discovery needs to be patentable, and we need to overcome this, I think, mistaken concern that 
when you're discovering something that exists in nature, if you patent that, you're just patenting the human genome, right, as an example of one of the concerns that you hear about. Uh, I, I totally get that. Um, we're beyond patenting, quote, the human genome now. We're talking about much more specific things. Unless we can come to grips with the fact we have got to permit patents for discoveries, we are in a huge ditch, and sequinom is what is what's shown the most bright light we've had shown on that yeah. to date. Now, um, the root of the problem from a lawyer's perspective is that discovery is in the patent law. It has been recognized as a type of patentable subject matter, right? The law says whoever invents or discovers, it doesn't just say with some exceptions. The Supreme Court made up these exceptions. They're not in the statute. Discovery positively is in the statute, right? So, you know, again, I, I can't offer great solutions here, but I can tell you there is a huge problem. Discoveries are now basically unpatentable on the back of the sequinome decision. Um, I think, un very unfortunately, given the level of importance that they've taken on in our modern life sciences industry. Yep, yep. So that's, that's some of the questions that I had based on the section 101, the patentable subject matter section of David's uh, talk. I, I, I noticed that we have some of our attorneys from our preferred providers here. Is there anybody in the audience now, just in terms of the 101 issues or whatever, any questions or any, David, yes, please. Um, I've been a patent attorney for a while. Um, when Commissioner Dudas was in the office, it was a total disaster. You came in and really straightened things out. Unfortunately, as we've been talking about, the Supreme Court came about and has made things absolutely horrible, especially for early stage research. I think the sequinone case is even worse than you're describing it because we had <laughs> oh, the geez. Federal Circuit, which is, has traditionally been a very pro-patent court, sort of turned this on, on its head because it was more than a discovery. It was an application of a discovery. The claim was limited to polymerase chain reaction. And the justices could have, the, the judges could have actually decided easily the other way around. It was an application of a discovery, yet they chose not to. So, so I think Myriad's bad, Prometheus is bad, um, Alice is bad, but this case is even worse. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, yeah. I don't have a question. It's just a statement. Yeah, fair point. Yeah. yeah. So I am concerned about that case a little bit. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, an, other issues that we deal with that we've historically dealt with, uh, which you you touched upon, is um, uh, the sections 102 and one, basically 103 uh, and 112 of the Patent Code. Uh, basically, 103 is obviousness. That is, in order to get a patent, uh, it has to be novel. And the standard of inventiveness is non-obvious, whether somebody of skill in the art wouldn't have put a couple of inventions together to come up with the claim that you have. Um, obviousness has always been a tricky issue. Uh, when I look at the invention disclosures that come in from our inventors, you know, obviousness is always a specter that, uh, that, that strikes me in the face sometimes. And it's, um, it, it's something that's concerning of how our office responds to an obviousness kind of issue. Uh, my uh, my theory on that, or the way I've sort of acted upon that, is to get back to the inventor and say, you're skilled in the art, please give us some reasons or, or explanations as to why somebody wouldn't have put those two together, or three together, or whatever. The more you put together, the more, you know, how obvious, how obvious could that be? Um, uh, that's the direction we've taken. Any, any comments on, on our approach, or better approaches, or, you know, advice you could give to the inventors? Yeah, so a couple of comments that come to mind. So this is an area where I think the law is much more functional. And while there are challenges, they're, they're not of a, uh, of a dramatic nature. So what I've seen going on in the last several years, there, there was a, a big sea change when this KSR decision came out in 2007. And the Supreme Court basically said, look, you guys, this teaching suggestion motivation a test for deciding whether some number of prior art references render an invention unpatentable is too rigid. Fine with it using it as a kind of a, uh, as a, as a basic test, but you gotta look beyond it. Um, and that did cause a shift towards examiners 
taking a situation, for instance, where inventor files patent application with a claim that says I've invented A, B, C, and D. The examiner finds a reference that shows A, B, another reference that shows C, and another reference that shows D. Before KSR, the examiner had to weave those references together and show how together they taught, suggested, or at least motivated the total combination A, B, C, D. After KSR, what we thought at the office for a while was, well, we don't have to do that anymore. If you can find A, B, C, D in some combination of references, throw them over the transom and expect the applicant to show that, that, that it wouldn't have been obvious to combine them together. There wouldn't have been a teaching suggestion motivation. But we've gradually, the office has gradually tacked back a bit from that, and the federal circuit has gradually pushed it back a little bit. I think in part because of concerns about the aggressive application of doctrine by the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the, the Patent Office Group. And so I think we've had some healthy, um, you know, uh, improved calibration and refinement of 103. And now we're to the point where, you know, what I would suggest is put it back on the examiner to say, look, you said these references teach, suggest, or you said these references combine to show the invention. You need to explain, you know, how they show the invention in some way. So I think it's, and, and examiners are being told now, you know, you've got to pre be prepared to come forward with something, not just the references, but some explanation that weaves them together. So I think that's healthy. I also um, am seeing increased examples where, um, and I think it's been going on for years, so it's probably not new news to people in this room, um, where unexpected results gets a lot of traction. It didn't used to get traction in the old days, but now, again, because KSR has set the bar up somewhat, maybe the bar has come down a little bit with the Federal Circuit decisions, but it's still higher than it was. The role of unexpected results is really important and can quickly get you over the hurdle. It can quickly counter uh, that 103 rejection. So this is why I feel like if you've got something that speaks to unexpected, uh, unexpected results, you know, put it in the patent application if you can. Certainly be prepared um, to talk to it. And I think those are tools that, uh, that create a fairly balanced playing field. Okay, because usually we don't give our, our, our PIs that kind of information, like look for unexpected results. Sometimes I give them things like teaching away, you know, but that's tough to find sometimes, yeah. you know. Um, the, um, so that's one of the issues. Uh, that's in terms of obviousness. Other issues that we have that I think our, our PIs are more aware of that we, uh, we're constantly grappling with, as you mentioned in your talk, and that is 112 enablement and written description. You know, we're caught between that thing with our inventors. Really, their life and blood is publishing, is disseminating the information, you know? Uh, even at a very early, and, and the work in and of itself is usually early stage in and of itself. And yet, you know, we're grappling with the need of our PIs to come out with that, but at the same time trying to protect that at a stage that still might be relatively embryonic and very, very early on and might, might not qualify. One, um, one issue, of course, is that old uh, genus species kind of thing, where you have a, you know, a, maybe one species or two species. How many, how many do you need to get a, a more valuable, a much more valuable genus claim? Yeah, yeah. So that area of the law, which I think is enormously interesting, has uh, been on the move with, I think, the courts providing some clarity on the genus species dichotomy to try and reflect that, you know, while you can't have a specific dividing line, you need three species and then you've enabled the, the genus or you need five species, um, there's more to be said than, you know, it's either a huge number of species or, you know, or one, right? There's got to be some way to make a judgment call about that. And there's, you know, I think a, a kind of a rough sense now that um, if you enable enough species so that are, you know, there's sort of a reasonable expectation that you understood there was a genus at play here and it's within engineering skill to find other species in the genus that you get coverage for the genus. This is an area that gets litigated a lot, which is where I've been seeing it. Um, so I, I feel like 
the laws moved in a constructive direction, which mean, in my mind means a clear direction. We just need clarity on things like species, genus. Right. Um, and beyond that, the enablement written description doctrine, remember we got rid of best mode in the AIA, so fortunately you don't have to think about that anymore. Um, enablement written description, though, is another area where, as I mentioned, we've had court decisions, including Supreme Court decisions, um, that have said, Look, we need, you know, this is a court speaking for Americans generally saying if you want to get a broad patent, you've got to provide a lot of disclosure. And the, the fundamental policy objective they were pursuing is to make sure that patentees weren't overreaching their disclosure, providing a narrow disclosure, and then trying to take broad claims. And both of those doctrines in different ways get at that need for a disclosure that is that tracks to the scope of the claims. So the reality is, you, as a PI, you just need to be aware. If you want broad claims, you're going to need to provide a lot of disclosure. And what, But you do want broad claims, so you do need to provide a lot of disclosure. And that's going to play off against the publication uh, imperative. And uh, it's a tension that is, it, frankly, it's good policy, so we all just have to live with it um, and, and recognize that we got to you know, sort of put our shoulder down and get a lot of disclosure in patent applications, which, by the way, is not only helpful relative to written description and enablement, but it feeds back into that 101 issue that I mentioned before. The more disclosure you end 103 for things like unexpected results, but especially 101, the more you provide details, the more tools you give the attorney to be able to get over uh, the rejections that the patent office is going to, yeah. but again, in. that's that that's that problem of very early on, you know, having those details available, etc. You that's, may not know, you may not have the details. You may, yeah. you may not have them. Yeah. Um, so, just a comment in that area. What I think is a hedge against that risk is provisionals. The provisional statute was kind of a godsend in the sense that, you know, you don't know for sure, and I see plenty of these cases. You get to a point where you think you've got it nailed, file a provisional. And I've dealt, I represent biotech clients and I see this. We file a provisional and then we find out like a month later, you know, that turned out to be a dead end. And it turns out that there's a different direction we got to go. All right, fine, file another provisional. Right. And, and, you, and you just have to keep doing that so that you've got the provisionals tracking the data and the discovery. I won't use the word discovery, and the science, yeah. and, and you'll, you know, you'll, quote, waste some of them, or you might throw some of them away. You just won't, won't uh, fold them over into non-provisional cases. But what you will have, then, is a great date to go with the data when it all comes together at the yes. same time. Pro provisionals for us are a scary proposition, especially provisional cover sheets that we file on. They are a scary proposition in terms of whether we radically enabled men, That's the uh, issue. enable yeah. those inventions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think a lot of our, our inventors out there might not know. We've, we've discussed enablement with them a lot. We don't discuss written description very much, which is implied, I guess, that the courts have implied it in, in Section 112 of the Patent Code, that uh, in addition to be able to tell the world, to the public, here's the recipe, here's how to practice the invention, but also you have to show us that you have possession of the invention. The recipe or the the cookbook is not enough. Yeah, yeah, you got to show you understand the invention. You yeah. actually have it in your grasp. Right, yeah. right. And a lot of times that's uh, an issue that we have. Audience, uh, outside of, yes? Uh, Jay Austin, just to follow up on your discussion, you were talking about the um, benefits of, of having written description. You might have a, you might have a mic uh, coming. Plan. I mean, you, you know, the, the topic here is protection of your, protecting your IP. And I, I think one of the other advantages of, of broad claims in these early provisionals and applications is even though you may not be able to get those claims or even look at all the, the, um, the uh, aspects of the claim, it does provide you protection once it's published um, for future applications. So you mean like freedom of action protection? Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. I, I think that's important, very important. Um, uh, you know, so-called FOA or freedom of action is the 
it's the alter ego of protection, right? You can have all the protection you want if someone else has a conflicting patent, you're still kind of dead in the water. So I, I, I think that's another great reason to, you know, to just spend the money you need to spend to file the cases you need to file. Some of them will work out, some won't. The other thing I thought you were going to say, which I think is another fair point, is it tends to flush the prior art out. So you get more prior art in the record, which is also good for everyone. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So, yes. No such thing. I think that if Coca-Cola was just going by patent protection, they would have been out of business many decades ago, and they rely on trade secrets. And what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of problem now with patenting discovery, but to what degree might this actually have the unintended consequence of making things trade secrets in attempt to mitigate or work around some of the protection issues? Yeah, that's a great question, and you are exactly right. And it is terrible policy. What's happening, another sort of fact and figure, the US patent application filing rate has stagnated since the Alice, you know, Myriad Mayo, four uh, henchmen cases came out. The European filing rates are still growing at a steady three, four, five percent. China, of course, continues to explode for exogenous reasons. Um, U.S. filing rates, for the first time in the history of our country, other than in times of war or depression, major recession, U.S. filing rates are stagnant. That's not a good sign, right? What that says is exactly the point you've raised. People are saying, I'm taking my marbles and going to play a different game. I'm just going to keep my technology secret for as long as I can. And if someone could figure it out, fine, but I'm not going to help them with that. And that's a scary thought. And I'll just tell you a, a quick story on that. You know, advising boards in my role that I'm in now, I was in a board discussion with a biotech company um, literally curing cancer. I mean, this is, you, you can't imagine more important things for humankind. And, and uh, a member of the board asked a question about all these cases, and, the, and the, um, the CEO turns to me and says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I think it's probably unpatentable because it's a discovery. And this member of the board said, well, then forget it. We're going to keep it trade secret. And I'm thinking, if this is happening in this board meeting, it's got to be happening in hundreds of board meetings all over our country. And think about the depressive effect on the sharing of human knowledge when smart human beings are electing to keep their knowledge secret. This is like pre-Renaissance. This is Dark Ages thinking, right? It's really unfortunate. <laughs> Happy <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks to David and his chat group. So uh, a hallmark for these uh, symposia is the chance to kind of take the broad issues down to the real world of what innovators uh, face here in our partners community. We're so fortunate to have such a senior panel tonight, multiple members of the National Academy of Sciences, also memberships in the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, we have a department chair, we have an active, busy surgeon, anesthesiologist, and cardiologist. And uh, moderating this panel from our office is Sharon Walker. Sharon is senior IP manager. Her PhD in pharmaceutical uh, chemistry uh, was from UCSF, her law degree from Suffolk University. So Sharon's going to moderate with this terrific panel, and she will do the formal introductions of that. Sharon? Oh, I thought you were doing this. Okay. Come on in. We can... Uh, okay, hop up there. So uh, on the far left, uh, uh, Dr. Cricket Seidman, uh, cardiologist, uh, geneticist, uh, and you'll hear a lot about her work. Uh, I think everyone, hopefully, uh, this MGH heavy audience knows uh, uh, Dr. Jay Austin, chair of plastic surgery, also an active inventor, several companies, as does uh, uh, Cricket, and then uh, Dr. Emery Brown, anesthesiologist also an active innovator. He also has several companies. Um, and we, I won't go through all their various academic centers, but Sharon will engage them in conversation now. So, Emery, why don't you um, give us a sense of your experience with respect to your IP and commercialization and you know, also perhaps what you wish you would have known 
you know, as when you started this journey. I mean, why I didn't get a law degree to, 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 to do it? <laughs> because you have us. You don't need a law degree. Okay. Uh, so the, the sort of work that I do is, as mentioned, I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist, and we've been thinking a lot about trying to create innovations in anesthesiology. And um, I guess one of the main things is that you know, I, we've come to practice over time was a lot of the basics which were just talked about, you know, appreciating you know, when you have an idea um, that you think could have IP value, you know, how to frame it properly, you know, how to get feedback on it, you know, how to, uh, you know, being careful about not to disclose it. In a, in a way that you know sort of enables such that you can't you know get it protected, and I think that's probably that's probably the biggest uh, that's probably the biggest thing to uh, be careful about. Because you're like, I just figured out, and you want to run out and publish the paper and you know, tell everybody about it, but you know you lose that opportunity to then go forward and perhaps protect it as IP and you know sort of seek out its seek out its commercial value. So I think the one thing that you know it's taken a while to get accustomed to, it, it's really that. But once we're in that mindset, you know, in our lab meetings, what have you, we have discussions about, oh, we've come up with this idea, we see this process, these are questions which we think we can pursue, and oh, should we start filing IP on this? So we, we start now and have very early conversations, you know, with your office or your, and your colleagues along those lines. And I think that, that took time to, to get accustomed to. And I think the, the second part was um, realizing how much I think, as an inventor, I think you guys are great helping us, but I think we still have to take intellectual control and often more of a, I don't know if the word is leadership, but an active role in the commercialization. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's not something where we can just like pass it off to you and say, right. can you go and find us? you know, business partners or those sorts of things. I, I found you really have to work actively on <laughs> I'll just repeat all of that. <laughs> no. But the last point being is I, I've, I've discovered that we really have to be active as, you know, inventors and right. coming up with potential, you know, investors or venture mm -hmm. funds or whatever because while I think you all are quite good at, and, and not that you don't help us in this regard, well, I think you're helping, very good at helping us frame our ideas, we really understand it. And I think you know, we have to put the energy in to really get it to market. And you are, mm -hmm. you are situated to know who the players are out there. And that's very helpful. And it allows us to work in collaboration with you. Sometimes, I, I think sometimes, I think it goes back and forth. Yeah. Because you know, very often, in an, you know, Quite frankly, people think there's nothing worth innovating about in anesthesiology. Interesting. What gives you that impression? Well, I mean, you know, it, it doesn't fall into a, a mold like um, a lot of the things around, you know, in medicine. You know, so you um, you can think of sort of two broad categories, you know, diagnostics or therapies. Right. And we're a process. I mean, you don't come to the hospital to have some good <laughs> anesthesia. Right? I mean, you, 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 it's like, oh, by the way, right. now I need anesthesia, right? right. Oh, God, I, Please give me I, I hadn't thought about I don't that, want right? This surgery without yeah, it. yeah. And then, you know, you know, they don't come around and like, oh, thank you. I just love that anesthesia. That was like, oh, no. It doesn't in, happen, right? In, in, so, in, in Hollywood, right. it does. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, in Hollywood, it yeah. does, right? right. No, but, but, but so then, and then also thinking very seriously about the value proposition, because what we're talking about is improving the process of sort of hospital flow. And you know we're not talking about a specific diagnostic technique or or a specific, you know, you know therapy. And so really trying to frame that so that, you know, you know, uh, venture funds or venture capitalists would you know want to engage engage in that is it, it's a challenge. It's non trivial. Thank you. So Jay, do you have any comments for us? Well, I lo I love an I love anesthesia. <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, you love anesthesia. I think it's very very important. Tell us about your experience. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, first, uh, thanks for having me here. I, we, we all get invited to do things, and this was the first one in a long time where my first inclination was to say, absolutely not. What do I have to <laughs> offer? 
this, uh, this group. I'd like to just start off by saying to the, the younger uh, inventors and the younger managers out there, um, firstly, to the younger inventors, don't be overwhelmed by all this stuff. It wasn't long ago where I had no idea what they were talking about, and I still don't know 101, 102, 103, but the basic concepts, you learn just like everything you all do, you learn it by the process, by doing it. And that's what happened to me. I think we were, you know, I'm a, a surgeon, but uh, had a very basic uh, immunology effort going on, and we as we applied that to problems we were interested in, came up with some interesting discoveries that we were gonna to go to Europe and talk about. And somehow, thank God, innovation found out about it and started to educate us. And um, through that process, uh, you know, myself and my group really have developed, I think like Emery's, a real passion for this. Um, and, um, you know, they really hit on a lot of the Im important things. I will, will say that uh, really one of the most important lessons, not just here in what we do, but as we try to um, develop these things into licenses or commercial enterprises is exactly what Emory said. I mean, I don't think that anybody here has achieved much by just handing it off to someone else. You are all doers and you gotta, nobody's gonna do this for you. Um, the innovation group is has been fantastic. I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of people who've helped move these things along, but the things that we do, and we're all over the map from, we've got a company in um, skin rejuvenation and, and um, transferring uh, tissues. We're working with L'Oreal on hair, uh, Boston Scientific on endosurgical <laughs> devices and, and lots of other things. Um, you know, we, we um, you know, we really have to, you know, we've learned how to really work well with, uh, with innovation. They've taught us how to do this. Sometimes they'll bring us, you know, because we're constantly interacting with them, they'll come to us and say, gee, you know, Boston Scientific might be interested in something you're doing. And so they create opportunities, we create opportunities, and there's, there's really a, a lot of back and forth there that's, uh, that's uh, great. To the managers, I think that, I hope the message to you I mean, there's a lot of senior managers here who are phenomenal, but it's critical that when you meet that innovator or inventor who, who just sort of has no clue, you know, they're getting, they're worried about their promotion and getting their NIH grant and writing that, getting that paper in Science or Nature, is just, you know, giving them the, the, that education. You know, we, we don't know what you're talking about when you first come and talk to us about obviousness and, and enablement and, and, and all this. I think also the, the, beyond the managers, the lawyers have been critical. I mean, I, I think of, you know, we've got some, you know, 60 some odd, odd applications out there, but the best, the very best were created by unbelievably great lawyers um, who are way smarter than I am on the subject matter. You know, we're all over the place. and We've got some patents in polymers. I don't know anything about polymers. Well, maybe I do now. But, um, you know, having a, a lawyer who is an expert in polymers to really help flesh that out was uh, was uh, critical. Thank you, fantastic. And Cricket, how has your IP sort of led you down the commercialization path or away from the commercialization path? So I'm probably the poster child for um, patents that have no value today because of the changing role of, of discovery. Um, my group has been involved um, for years in understanding root causes of diseases and frankly I believe that we've made major contributions to gene-based diagnosis in the cardiovascular arena, full stop. Uh, and that, believe it or not, is not patentable. What um, I learned today and what I am interested in, uh, and I have some suggestions for Chris on this regard, is that um, the changing scope, I've known for many, many years now, the changing scope of what is and is not patentable requires that you don't literally try and do it on your own. You need the expertise of innovation. Um, but equally so, I'll echo the response that we need to be more involved in teaching innovation about what and, is, what, and what is and what is not obvious. 
So for example, um, discovery of a gene, well that is a natural product, but interpretation of what variants in that gene mean, I would still to this day argue, is not obvious. And I'll give you one case in point. Um, if you have all of these gene sequences that we can all readily do by twiddling down the hall and up the street to the Broad Institute, um, if we knew all of the meanings of those variants, we would today not have blood-based diagnoses for every uh, newborn child who has to have their heel pricked. We would not be taking blood at the time of a cancer diagnosis and analyzing it in comparison to a tissue. Uh, we would rather say we know the interpretation and we'll apply it broad scale. In fact, the pushback is against that for that very reason. So there is a need for us, in my opinion, to educate um, in much more greater detail what is and is not obvious and what the meaning and the value is, the same as the process is valuable, the interpretation is very valuable. Now, I would also argue that while there has been a decline in the patentability of these um, features, that they have actually spurred economic development, just not economic development within academics. So, all of the gene-based companies in the United States and indeed around the world would not exist were it not for the discoveries that all of you and some of us have made. And so there is um, an engine, an economic engine that's profiting for it. And I think that's an important thing for us to realize that there ought to be better ways to try and shift that balance a little bit to bring some of those resources back to um, perhaps the NIH, if they're the ones that funded the research, perhaps to the partners, um, and perhaps to the individual. Yes, it's just unfortunate that our, the current state of our law isn't making it possible for the discovery to be patented. Well, I think they are patented. I mean, you know, there are still well, use patent is patents that do occur, and, um, you know, we certainly have held one several for several years. Um, and then the other thing that all of you know is, you know, a discovery is often a birth announcement. It's what you do with it after time, and that's the next stage. <coughs> Many of us spend a lot more time. Right. Yeah. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for our investigators? Is there anything? I'm, a, I'm an attorney um, working with a, a lot of different companies, particularly in software uh, and some in, in the intersection of software and biotech. And I'm curious, uh, as we talk about all the recent uh, adjustments that have been made in the, the law of late, uh, and as, as um, Director Kapos was saying, there's a little bit of a pendulum in the law that it's swung one way we can anticipate that it always swings the other way. How you're currently um, pursuing and thinking about your intellectual property, and have you started to pull back a little bit, or are you still filing, expecting that by the time it gets to the place where it's being examined or the place where it might be asserted at that time in the future, um, whether the law will have caught up and that will be patentable subject matter again? Uh, because, you know, if, if you were to pull back now, um, you m might lose that opportunity uh, that when the law comes back to catch up. I think this question is particularly applicable to you and to you personally. Yeah, sure. So uh, you, you're right. I mean, the, you know, it's, you can't patent an algorithm. Right. I mean, so so that's kind of the, you know the, kind of the the, the 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 short statement. And you know, you really have to show that you have. Uh, some calculations that are tied to a process which is tied to a physical entity. And, and, and I think what we've tried to do, we, you know, we had a couple of ideas which we, we um, you know, this, you know, couldn't meet the Alice test, basically. And we just, we didn't abandon them, we just took them underground and we used them as trade secrets. And then in another case, we then went the extra mile to actually say, okay, this is a calculation, it's a non-trivial calculation, we don't think it's an obvious calculation, but you know, it's gonna provide us some real-time diagnostic information which we wouldn't get otherwise. Oh, and let's make sure it's tied to a physical process. 
So, so we actually, we've done both, actually. So. Yeah, I would second that. Um, I think the, the challenge I see is that um, keeping things as a trade secret is difficult if you're going to write a grant. Um, and as I think many of us recognize, that is what fuels the ongoing and next discovery. And so there's a, a challenge there. So we have actually elected um, in the diagnostic arena, in particular for gene discovery, to abandon that as a patentable um, utility. And our group continues to, I think, make important discoveries, and we continue to publish them. Um, moreover, not only do we publish them after peer review, as all of you know, they go into bioarchives, which is pre-review publication as well. So um, the genetics field has really moved to an open source discovery platform. Um, that being said, that those insights, I think, are something that are worthy of more um, investment and protection. And so to that end, again, gene discovery is a birth announcement. It tells you something deeply about biology. And if you can capture that essence, and we've done that in several instances, and that's led to a mechanism that we can target with a small molecule and maintain IP around that. So I would agree. Both processes are very important. Thank you. I'm on the question of uh, holding back IP versus going ahead and filing it. If we go ahead and file now in China or Europe, how is that going to impact the patentability if it's filed and doesn't get granted or you're trying to keep the claims alive in the U.S. as we go forward? Are we actually putting our own domestic patents in jeopardy? Well, if you... If you file in another jurisdiction before you file in the U.S., that can certainly be what is deemed prior art. Right. So, yes. If you're already filed in the U.S. at the same time. Well, if you're filing at the, in this, at the same time, you shouldn't have any issue as long as there's... Uh, wow. It's about this it's problem subject. of the delay and, and, and potential change in the way the laws are swinging. Right. So the delay in the U.S., essentially, you, you will have a shorter patent term if you were to get a patent later down the line versus you know, getting earlier grant in Europe or in China, for example. Shorter abroad, right. There's a question, There's a question there. right back there. Uh, I just wanted to have a uh, discussion about the increasing premium that's being placed at the NIH on reproducibility of data and the tension there with trade secrets and how labs can reproduce data if, we don't, if they don't know exactly what's being done to gather the data in the first place and the impact that has on the scientific community. Would one of you like to comment on that? Do you have any? Well, I mean, I've been part of a couple of National Academies panels, which is, you know, <laughs> which has, you know, looked at this issue and talked about sort of the whole spectrum of things that are, that impinge upon it. Everything from not being able, not knowing all the details of the experiment to the statistical aspects, which are often the, the data weren't analyzed properly or, or, or more commonly, it's not that it weren't analyzed properly, it's a weak inference framework. It's a framework where it doesn't provide a compelling inference. And if you ask to provide a more compelling inference, you'd see that it's actually weak. And I'm thinking specifically about that dirty word, p-values. All right? So, so, so th that's, that, that's a real issue. And I think that, you know, again, thinking about it from a, the impact from a patent standpoint, you, you know, you could rush out and file your provisional, file your disclosure, file your provisional, and then hope that you're going to get, you know, more robust data. And you know you 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 put your idea out there. Someone's going to try to to basically reproduce it, but I guess the thinking is in our group we're very conservative about these things. I mean we we really make sure that you know we can reproduce what we're talking about, and and we're we're extremely careful. We're extremely careful with the analyses, and 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 that in particular in the in the mode of inference. You know we try to make sure we're making compelling inference, because that's the only way that you know you can you know that you you know that you can stand the test of time and also the the test of the arguments coming back from the patent examiners. I 
Michaela Levin, thank you for your time tonight. I was wondering in your experience how you uh, judge the unmet need that wasn't met by not patenting something, by not being able to patent because you can't get around 101. Uh, what is, you know, I think we see the commercial value that goes down, and as the director just said, the invalidation of patents will destroy many parts of the industry at some point. Oh, or our, you know, our growth. But what do you see as scientists and doctors in terms of how that affects the unmet need that we are not meeting? Jay, would you? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, if I understand your question, you're you're asking about you know proceeding on work and on things that's uh, well. I mean, you know, we're 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 all here to help people and help patients. And that's really one of the great lessons I learned working with innovation early on. I remember coming up with one crazy idea where we, it was very unclear where it would be patentable, talking to a very senior person at innovation. And you know, at the end of sort of a 45 minute explanation of what we were thinking about, she said, I have no idea if this could be patent, but this would be so cool. You got to keep going forward with this. And I'm sure everybody up here feels that way. That, you know, that's ultimately the goal. I am not so much somebody who gets a lot of NIH funding. Sometimes we're included on DOD. We've tried. Um, but, you know, it, you, you got to get, you know, it, it's a dirty word here, but money matters. And if, if nobody wants to pay for your idea, whether it's NIH or DOD or companies, um, it's, it's going to be very hard for you to take this passion of yours forward. We've... Um, taken advantage of the opportunities here and the expertise of innovation to find funding. And so we think we happen to think about what people are going to be interested in, what is fundable um, early. And I think, you know, the, the timing of when you file, that's, that's it's a very important point. And, and a couple things. Innovation is great, but like everything, they've got limitations. There's only so much money, so many people, so much time. And, you know, some of the sort of pitfalls of that is, you know, you, you file something, it's a provisional, not a lot of money, people are interested, you've got a year to come up with that data, but you gotta think about the next step, which is who's gonna, somebody, if, if somebody's not interested in that IP, innovation is not necessarily gonna file it beyond the US. And, you know, in our field of aesthetic medicine, for example, if you only file in the US, and three years later, some big company comes and looks at you, that might be a problem if you've missed the boat. So you, you, you sort of have to think about, you know, as best you can, what's the, what's the life cycle of this going to be? What's your ability to move it forward, whether it's, you know, your grants or, or interest, other interested parties? And you've got to be thinking about that early because you file the greatest idea in the world, but, you know, and you go to innovation and say, oh, my God, the market's in, in Japan and China and all these other places. It's really hard for them to say, gee, uh, nobody's interested in this. Um, we, we can't really do that for everything. Uh, so I think that, that those are important considerations. So, so I, I guess the way I think about it, Michaela, is, you know, you know just, just like, you know, you learn different models in physics and you learn which models apply in which circumstances, same thing with statistics, you learn which model mm. apply in which circumstances. Mm. I mean, I think what we're talking about here is a calculus, essentially. Mm. So we're, the calculus that we've been discussing here up until now has primarily been centered on filing IP, all right? And filing IP is a way to incentivize innovations, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of I would say a lot. There's several things out there where if you could proceed generically, you could probably have a substantial advance. And then the question is, so then maybe this is a question for you all, you know, can you teach us the calculus of how to proceed through generics in certain cases? You know, is that something which we should be schooled in as well as, as we're being schooled in how to think about IP? Because, you know, maybe there's some things that can be repurposed and used as generics and you could have a tremendous impact, you know, meet an unmet need. And, you know, one of the areas where this may be very, very important, which is our current opioid epidemic, right? Maybe there are many things which could be repurposed to help us out there across the whole spectrum of, of problems that we're confronting there. So I would just add that um, unmet need is something that I think has gone to the streets. 
there are patients who are far more vocal about their particular need and small groups of patients who share them than has ever been true before. And I actually think this is a very, very positive opportunity because they can help you articulate and push forward ideas perhaps even better than a scientist can. And I've been very encouraged by, um, you know, you only need to look at Vertex right around the block from us to see what a patient population can do to drive discovery and say, this is something we will solve and we're going to help you figure out how to do that. So I, I think there's real opportunity to engage the needing population in the call for discovery and the call to solve it and even to patent it. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being on this panel. I really appreciate you coming and sharing your stories with us. And thank you, everyone, for being here. So I want to, uh, in the final, uh, final analysis here, I'd like to thank everybody that participated in our symposium. Uh, in regards to um, what was presented today, I think our panel here made some very, very important points that we take very, very seriously in innovation. And I hope it's been expressed here that we're throwing around things like 101, 102, 103 enablement. It's got a lingua in and of itself. Our professors, our PIs, they have a lingua, you know, gene, genes, biomarkers, uh, uh, aesthetic products, etc. So. The science is very deep, and it's very good here. We also have our language. I think education was mentioned by our panel several, several times, and I think that's the approach at least we in innovation try to make, is it's an, a cross-education process in terms of how we approach things, which can be very different. Inventorship can be very different from being an authorship on a paper. As one example, those terms 102, 103, as Jay had said, you know, you pick it up after a while and hopefully We've educated a little bit, and they certainly have educated us. And so I hope you get a feel for how we've approached things with our, our, our constituents. And uh, I want to thank David again for presenting this globally within the, uh, the prospect of the kind of things that we face in an ever-changing landscape and how we try to navigate ourselves to this very important part of the symposium, protection of IP. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.